Part 1. You will hear people talking in eight different situations. For questions 1 to 8, choose the best answer, A, B, or C. Question 1. You are at a college lecture when you hear this student interrupting the lecturer. Which was highly controversial anyway, and of course, if you consider the implication of this new law, uh, yes? Excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt. You said something very important about the core laws, and I was just wondering... Actually, they were the corn laws. You know the agricultural plant? Oh, sorry, I missed some of what you said. It was very fast. Could you possibly go back over this? Well, no, you'll find all of that in my book... Price fifteen ninety nine at the college bookshop. Now, where was I? Which was highly controversial anyway, and of course, if you consider the implication of this new law, uh, yes? Excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt. You said something very important about the core laws, and I was just wondering... Actually, they were the corn laws. You know the agricultural plant? Oh, sorry, I missed some of what you said. It was very fast. Could you possibly go back over this? Well, no, you'll find all of that in my book, Price fifteen ninety nine at the College Bookshop. Now, where was I? Question 2. You hear this politician being interviewed on TV. No doubt, all of you listening are worried about taxes, and so you should be. The Christian Democratic Alliance have said nothing about their plans to alter the tax brackets, and these are changes that will go straight to the pockets of hard-working people like yourselves, and we all know where the social liberal Democrats stand on this issue. They'll be taxing everything in sight. However... We in the LDP believe in a fairer approach to administering the national economy. No doubt, all of you listening are worried about taxes, and so you should be. The Christian Democratic Alliance have said nothing about their plans to alter the tax brackets, and these are changes that will go straight to the pockets of hard-working people like yourselves, and we all know where the Social Liberal Democrats stand on this issue. They'll be taxing everything in sight. However... We in the LDP believe in a fairer approach to administering the national economy. Question 3. You overhear a hotel receptionist speaking on the telephone with a customer. Hello, Halfway Hotel, can I help you? Yes, we take bookings. Um, uh, well, actually, I'm very sorry, but I don't think we'll be able to manage that. I suggest you try ringing the Spa Hotel in Tunbridge Wells. They have over twice the number of rooms we have and offer very much the same facilities and standards, although you will end up paying rather more. Hello, Halfway Hotel, can I help you? Yes, we take bookings. Um, uh, well, actually, I'm very sorry, but I don't think we'll be able to manage that. I suggest you try ringing the Spa Hotel in Tunbridge Wells. They have over twice the number of rooms we have and offer very much the same facilities and standards, although you will end up paying rather more. Question 4. You overhear this woman talking to her child in a shop. And now we're just dying to see the next episode, to see if they really... Kylie, put that down. It doesn't belong to you. I said, put it 
down. How many times have I told you not to touch things that don't belong to you? Now, where were we? And now we're just dying to see the next episode to see if they really... Kylie, put that down. It doesn't belong to you. I said put it down. How many times have I told you not to touch things that don't belong to you? Now, where were we? Question 5. You overhear this woman talking about a problem she had with a CD player. Anyway, the CD was in the machine. I couldn't get it out. I couldn't play it and I was worried because I wasn't sure if it was still under guarantee. I was also furious because it was Angie's favourite album. So I took the whole machine along to Luntham's service counter, expecting to hear the worst. And they were wonderful. Said they'd been getting quite a lot of the same complaint about that model. And he fixed it right there in front of me. And I didn't have to pay a penny. Not like some shops I could mention. Anyway, the CD was in the machine. I couldn't get it out. I couldn't play it and I was worried because I wasn't sure if it was still under guarantee. I was also furious because it was Angie's favourite album. So I took the whole machine along to Luntham's service counter, expecting to hear the worst. And they were wonderful. Said they'd been getting quite a lot of the same complaint about that model. And he fixed it right there in front of me. And I didn't have to pay a penny. Not like some shops I could mention. Question 6. You're at a payphone in a hotel when you hear this man ordering a taxi to take him home. Yes, hello. I'd like a taxi. Yes, just one taxi. The name is Carter. Yes, I'm at the halfway hotel. I'd like to go to Radley Road, number 269. How soon can you send a cab? OK, then, that, that's fine. I'll be waiting outside the main entrance. Thank you. Yes, hello. I'd like a taxi. Yes, just one taxi. The name is Carter. Yes, I'm at the halfway hotel. I'd like to go to Radley Road, number 269. How soon can you send a cab? OK, then, that, that's fine. I'll be waiting outside the main entrance. Thank you. Question 7. You are on a train when you overhear this man talking about the prices of railway tickets. That station master was really helpful, wasn't he? I mean, he didn't have to tell me about the young person's travel card. I've just saved £3 off the full price. This ticket would have cost me £9.50, but with a card it's only £6.50 which is in fact a lot less than I paid last year, and that was before the fares increased. It was 7 50 then. Mind you, I did also have to pay £10 to buy the card, but it's going to be very useful over the next few months, what with travelling to Scotland. That station master was really helpful, wasn't he? I mean, he didn't have to tell me about the young person's travel card. I've just saved £3 off the full price. This ticket would have cost me £9.50, but with a card it's only £6.50, which is in fact a lot less than I paid last year, and that was before the fares increased. It was £7.50 then. Mind you, I did also have to pay £10 to buy the card, but it's going to be very useful over the next few months, what with travelling to Scotland.
Question eight. You hear this man on the radio introducing a song. And that, of course, was the latest single from the Vegetables, and that is currently at number nine in the charts after six weeks in the top ten, and still at number one for the seventh successive week. The song that everyone loved when they first heard it, but I think we're all ready for a new number one, aren't we? Well, if you're not, here it is again: Husky Ladies from Wrap It Up. And that, of course, was the latest single from the Vegetables, and that is currently at number nine in the charts after six weeks in the top ten, and still at number one for the seventh successive week. The song that everyone loved when they first heard it, but I think we're all ready for a new number one, aren't we? Well, if you're not, here it is again: Husky Ladies from Wrap It Up. That is the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You will hear part of an international radio broadcast on the subject of Guy Fawkes Night, an annual public celebration in Great Britain. For questions nine to eighteen, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have forty-five seconds in which to look at part two. Every year in Britain, at the beginning of November, schools have a one-week holiday, and on the fifth of November, many people celebrate Guy Fawkes Night. The celebration centres around the burning of a life-size model of a man with a black hat and beard called Guy. The model has been specially made for this purpose. It's a wonderful time for kids of all ages. But not so much fun for cats and dogs, which are usually terrified by sounds of exploding fireworks and sky rockets. To understand the reasons for this tradition, we have to go back almost four hundred years to a time when there were two important religious groups in Britain: the Catholics and the Protestants. For many years, there had been fighting between them. In 1605, the king James I and his government were Protestants, and they made life rather difficult for the country's Catholics, of which there were many. According to the popular story, a group of prominent Catholics met secretly and decided that the king and his government must die. They came up with the idea of destroying the Houses of Parliament with explosives. The leader of this gang of conspirators was a man called Robert Catesby. Of course, being well-known Catholics, the group were not trusted by the government, and so they needed the help of a professional soldier who the government officers would not recognise. The man they eventually found for the job was Guy Fawkes. After an unsuccessful attempt to dig a tunnel. The conspirators bought a house beside the Parliament building, which already had a tunnel going into the Houses of Parliament from its cellar. For many weeks, Catesby and his companions moved huge barrels of highly explosive gunpowder along the tunnel, and placed them in exactly the right places under the government building. When the King and his Parliament had their first meeting of the year in November. The conspirators planned to explode the gunpowder, 
and so kill everybody in the building. Guy Fawkes had the important job of watching the street outside the conspirators' house and warning the others of any approaching danger. Well, the king found out about the plot, and he sent soldiers to arrest them. However, they found only Guy Fawkes on duty outside the house. The other conspirators had escaped. Eventually, all the plotters were caught and executed, but Guy Fawkes has remained the most famous, probably on account of his being caught first. There was also another result of the discovery of the plot. Afterwards, all Catholics in England were blamed for the attempted attack, and this gave the Protestant government the excuse it wanted to persecute the Catholics even more. Although these events are still celebrated throughout Britain today, Catholics and Protestants have learned to live together in peace, and so the celebration itself is mostly harmless fun. Besides, the story is no longer believed by most serious historians. You will hear the piece again. Every year in Britain, at the beginning of November, schools have a one-week holiday, and on the 5th of November, many people celebrate Guy Fawkes Night. The celebration centres around the burning of a life-size model of a man with a black hat and beard called Guy. The model has been specially made for this purpose. It's a wonderful time for kids of all ages, but not so much fun for cats and dogs, which are usually terrified by sounds of exploding fireworks and sky rockets. To understand the reasons for this tradition, we have to go back almost 400 years to a time when there were two important religious groups in Britain, the Catholics and the Protestants. For many years, there had been fighting between them. In 1605, the king, James I, and his government were Protestants, and they made life rather difficult for the country's Catholics, of which there were many. According to the popular story, a group of prominent Catholics met secretly and decided that the king and his government must die. They came up with the idea of destroying the Houses of Parliament with explosives. The leader of this gang of conspirators was a man called Robert Catesby. Of course, being well-known Catholics, the group were not trusted by the government, and so they needed the help of a professional soldier who the government officers would not recognise. The man they eventually found for the job was Guy Fawkes. After an unsuccessful attempt to dig a tunnel, the conspirators bought a house beside the Parliament building, which already had a tunnel going into the Houses of Parliament from its cellar. For many weeks, Catesby and his companions moved huge barrels of highly explosive gunpowder along the tunnel and placed them in exactly the right places under the government building. When the King and his Parliament had their first meeting of the year in November, the conspirators planned to explode the gunpowder and so kill everybody in the building. Guy Fawkes had the important job of watching the street outside the conspirators' house and warning the others of any approaching danger. Well, the King found out about the plot and he sent soldiers to arrest them. However, they found only Guy Fawkes on duty outside the house. The other conspirators had escaped. Eventually, all the plotters were caught and executed, but Guy Fawkes has remained the most famous, probably on account of his being caught first. There was also another result of the discovery of the plot. Afterwards, all Catholics in England were blamed for the attempted attack, and this gave the Protestant government the excuse it wanted to persecute the Catholics even more. Although these events are still celebrated throughout Britain today, Catholics and Protestants have learned to live together in peace, 
and so the celebration itself is mostly harmless fun. Besides, the story is no longer believed by most serious historians. That is the end of part two. Part two. Now turn to part three. You will hear five different people being interviewed on the radio about Christmas. For questions nineteen to twenty-three, choose from the list A to H which words best describe their feelings about this celebration. Use the letters only once. There are three extra letters which you do not need to use. You now have thirty seconds in which to look through part three. Speaker one. Well, I suppose some of it was quite nice, but it really could have been so much better. After all, I went to a lot of effort this year to make it something special, but somehow it didn't quite work. I mean, everybody had masses to eat. There were eight of us sitting down to dinner, and we must have spent a fortune on presents this year. But looking around the room, you couldn't see it in people's faces. And then there was all the quarrelling over what we were going to watch on TV. And I don't seem to remember a single person actually saying thank you and really meaning it. Speaker two. I was all set to have another unexciting Christmas in the bedsitter where I'm living now. Of course, I'd sent my kids Christmas presents, but I knew I wouldn't be hearing from them. My ex-wife doesn't allow it, so I bought myself a two-pound chicken from Dewhurst's and a four-pack of Lime Brand Extra, and I got a stack of pound coins for the electric meter so that at least I could be warm and watch some telly. And then. Just as I was putting the chicken into the oven, there was a knock at the door, and it was the father of the family just across the road saying they noticed that I was going to be alone that day, and would I like to join them? And of course, I had a wonderful time. Speaker three. It isn't over yet. I mean, we've had the actual festivities on the twenty-fifth, but there's so much more to Christmas than that. Our parish church is putting on a festival of nine lessons and carols on Sunday evening, and if that's not your cup of tea, then there's the charitable association Santa Claus Pram Race on Monday. Although I won't be taking part in that this year, and this Christmas it's even been snowing, so I'll be taking my grandchildren up to Coniston Hill for some tobogganing, or they can build a snowman if the snow's good enough. That's on Tuesday, and then. Speaker four. It wasn't as good as it's been in the past. For a start, the telly was pretty disappointing, especially after last year's. I mean, we had Terminator last Christmas Eve, but all we got this year was RoboCop again. And the weather, <laughs> the weather's been really bad. So most of the football was cancelled. And then to top it all, our video machine broke down on Christmas Day. So there's been nothing to watch all Christmas, and then just to finish off any last chance of a decent holiday, someone suggested we all play Monopoly. Well, I went out to walk the dog in the snow. Speaker five. Well, I wouldn't say I enjoyed it. I spent the three days before the twenty-fifth standing outside Fielding's pet shop with a placard trying to stop people buying pets as presents. And did they listen? People were going in and out of the pet shop all day, and you should have seen the number of baby cats, dogs, and rabbits that people were buying as presents. And you know what's going to happen to them—the same as every year. 
A week after Christmas, they'll be out on the streets, fending for themselves in temperatures well below zero. But what's most distressing is the tropical birds. These beautiful animals can die in a matter of hours if left outside. You will hear the piece again. Speaker one. Well, I suppose some of it was quite nice, but it really could have been so much better. After all, I went to a lot of effort this year to make it something special, but somehow it didn't quite work. I mean, everybody had masses to eat. There were eight of us sitting down to dinner, and we must have spent a fortune on presents this year. But looking around the room, you couldn't see it in people's faces. And then there was all the quarrelling over what we were going to watch on TV. And I don't seem to remember a single person actually saying thank you and really meaning it. Speaker two. I was all set to have another unexciting Christmas in the bedsitter where I'm living now. Of course, I'd sent my kids Christmas presents, but I knew I wouldn't be hearing from them. My ex-wife doesn't allow it, so I bought myself a two-pound chicken from Dewhurst's and a four-pack of Lime Brand Extra, and I got a stack of pound coins for the electric meter so that at least I could be warm and watch some telly. And then. Just as I was putting the chicken into the oven, there was a knock at the door, and it was the father of the family just across the road saying they noticed that I was going to be alone that day, and would I like to join them? And of course, I had a wonderful time. Speaker three. It isn't over yet. I mean, we've had the actual festivities on the twenty-fifth, but there's so much more to Christmas than that. Our parish church is putting on a festival of nine lessons and carols on Sunday evening, and if that's not your cup of tea, then there's the charitable association Santa Claus Pram Race on Monday. Although I won't be taking part in that this year, and this Christmas it's even been snowing, so I'll be taking my grandchildren up to Coniston Hill for some tobogganing, or they can build a snowman if the snow's good enough. That's on Tuesday, and then. Speaker four. It wasn't as good as it's been in the past. For a start, the telly was pretty disappointing, especially after last year's. I mean, we had Terminator last Christmas Eve, but all we got this year was RoboCop again, and the weather—the <laughs> weather's been really bad. So most of the football was cancelled, and then to top it all, our video machine broke down on Christmas Day. So there's been nothing to watch all Christmas, and then just to finish off any last chance of a decent holiday, someone suggested we all play Monopoly. Well, I went out to walk the dog in the snow. Speaker five. Well, I wouldn't say I enjoyed it. I spent the three days before the twenty-fifth standing outside Fielding's pet shop with a placard trying to stop people buying pets as presents. And did they listen? People were going in and out of the pet shop all day, and you should have seen the number of baby cats, dogs, and rabbits that people were buying as presents. And you know what's going to happen to them? The same as every year. A week after Christmas, they'll be out on the streets, fending for themselves in temperatures well below zero. But what's most distressing is the tropical birds. These beautiful animals can die in a matter of hours if left outside. That is the end of part three. Part three. Now turn to part four. You will hear a woman and a man speaking together on a train. For questions twenty-four to thirty, choose the best answer: A, B, or C. There will now be a pause of one minute for you to look through part four.
It's me again. No, no, look, this is no good. I'm talking to you on my mobile, and the train keeps going into tunnels and we get cut off. Yes, I know this is important. Look, I'll phone you again when I get off to change trains at Haywards Heath. OK, then. Uh, excuse me, did I just hear you say Haywards Heath? Well, uh, yes, that's where... But isn't this the train for Salisbury? I mean, that's what it said on the board. Oh, I think you should have been in the front four coaches. You see, the train divided at Red Hill, and this is one of the rear four coaches, which goes on to Brighton. Oh, oh, but that's impossible. It didn't say anything on the announcement board. How, how did you know? They made an announcement. Didn't you hear it? Uh, no. I can't believe this is happening. Well, if you don't believe me, go and ask the guard. Oh, hang on. If this is the Brighton train, I haven't got the right ticket. I could end up having to pay extra and I've only got plastic, which he won't accept. Well, what you could do is get off at the next station and get the next train going back to Red Hill... Let's see. The last one was three bridges, so we should be arriving in Bolcombe in just a minute. And I can just get on another train without showing my ticket? Ah, now that's a point. That'll be a bit difficult at a small station like Bolcombe. No, what you need to do is get off at Haywards Heath and cross to Platform 3, where the northbound trains depart from. Is that what you're doing? Not exactly. I'll be taking the connecting service to Lewis, but I can show you where to go. Uh, look, thanks very much. I really appreciate this. Uh, you don't happen to know if there actually is a northbound train to Redhill at this time of night? Mm, I think they run trains all night because of Gatwick Airport. But if you like, I could phone through to Central Inquiries and make sure... Oh, if it wouldn't be too much trouble. Look, um, I really appreciate this. No, don't mention it. Now, let's see if I can get this thing to work this time. You will hear the piece again. It's me again. No, no, look, this is no good. I'm talking to you on my mobile, and the train keeps going into tunnels and we get cut off. Yes, I know this is important. Look, I'll phone you again when I get off to change trains at Haywards Heath. OK, then. Uh, excuse me, did I just hear you say Haywards Heath? Well, uh, yes, that's where... But isn't this the train for Salisbury? I mean, that's what it said on the board. Oh, I think you should have been in the front four coaches. You see, the train divided at Red Hill, and this is one of the rear four coaches, which goes on to Brighton. Oh, oh, but that's impossible. It didn't say anything on the announcement board. How, how did you know? They made an announcement. Didn't you hear it? Uh, no, I can't believe this is happening. Well, if you don't believe me, go and ask the guard. Oh, hang on. If this is the Brighton train, I haven't got the right ticket. I could end up having to pay extra, and I've only got plastic, which he won't accept. Well, what you could do is get off at the next station and get the next train going back to Red Hill. Let's see. The last one was three bridges, so we should be arriving in Bolcombe in just a minute. And I can just get on another train without showing my ticket? Ah, now that's a point. That'll be a bit difficult at a small station like Bolcombe. No, what you need to do is get off at Haywards Heath and cross to Platform 3, where the northbound trains depart from. Is that what you're doing? Not exactly. I'll be taking the connecting service to Lewis, but I can show you where to go. Uh, look, thanks very much. I really appreciate this. Uh, 
you don't happen to know if there actually is a northbound train to Redhill at this time of night? Hmm. I think they run trains all night because of Gatwick Airport. But if you like, I could phone through to Central Inquiries and make sure. Oh, if it wouldn't be too much trouble. Look, um, I really appreciate this. No, don't mention it. Now, let's see if I can get this thing to work this time. That is the end of part four. There will now be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. Be sure to follow the numbering of all the questions. I shall remind you when there is one minute left, so that you are sure to finish in time. Pause for four minutes. You have one more minute left. That is the end of the test. Please stop now. Your supervisor will now collect all the question papers and answer sheets. That is the end of part four.